On behalf of the Mecklenburg County Bar, thank you for selecting this recorded seminar for your CLE credits. The Bar depends on and appreciates your support. While we always love to see you in person at the Bar and Foundation Center, we know that this replay can be a real convenience to you by saving you some travel time and expense. For information on how to get your CLE credits with an MCB replay or online course, head to our website at www.mecbarcle.org. We'd also love to hear from you on new ideas you may have for future CLE programs. Thanks again for supporting the bar, and now enjoy this program. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started, and uh, the remaining couple coming in will just have to catch up. Um, thank you guys for taking time out of your, your busy day and your jobs and lives to uh, you know come to this event and have a discussion about addiction and mental health issues. And I, I really would like it to be a discussion, um, not just up, me up here pontificating. And so we're gonna go through a, a lot of information and uh, you know, some of the uh, you know basics of addiction, but hopefully some new information that's come out recently that uh, will be uh, new and fresh to you guys. And I very much want it to be a dialogue and, and encourage it to be a, a discussion. <clears throat> And so, as Michelle said, my name is Ward Blanchard, and just get the required professional disclosure out. I am a uh, marriage and family therapist, licensed clinical addiction specialist, and clinical supervisor. I've been working in the field of uh, behavior help for almost 15 years now. Uh, you know, born and raised on the Outer Banks, and but I spent most of my career out in Southern California and working in uh, various forms of uh, mental health and addiction. Uh, you know, around the country and all different levels of treatment and uh, everywhere I went, uh, collaboration and partnership with the legal system, um, you know, attorneys, uh, you know, was a, a very much a, a part of what we did on a regular basis. So I really uh, appreciate the opportunity and grateful the opportunity to come, uh, you know, chat and have a discussion with the legal arm. And I have an MBA in healthcare and I have two uh, financial disclosures. I own and operate a treatment center and a private practice here in Charlotte. and. Um, uh, you know, when we talk about the disease of addiction nowadays and uh, mental health, it's, you know, no longer is it in the days of the early 80s of when, you know, Betty Ford was the pioneer of coming out with it. Uh, you know, we can't pick up the newspaper or open the uh, uh, magazines or look at the news without hearing about the opioid epidemic. And, you know, it's the topic of du jour for, uh, you know, politicians and how they're going to address that. And so um, it's something that is in, you know, on our lips and in our society regularly. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some stuff that, and the root cause much more than the opioid epidemic. It's what I call a, a nation held hostage and uh, some of the patterns that we see, not just sort of the surface surface level, level uh, issues with the opioid epidemic, but the what I call the addiction pandemic uh, that really uh, holds this nation hostage. Uh, you know, the d disease model le lecture has been something that's been around for decades. And uh, most of the time when I go around uh, to the nation's conferences and, and do this uh, presentation to uh, healthcare systems or, or CMEs or even, you know, my own field, uh, very few of the professionals uh, uh, know the most up-to-date information. And this is very uh, fresh uh, data that we try to present. You know, our industry as a whole, they produced a research article that uh, pretty much operates on information and treatment modalities that are 17 to 20 years old. And uh, that's the... Uh, the the dated uh, material that we're using to treat people and you know just think about the technology you were using 17 to 20 years ago and that's what we're we're trying to use to treat this disease and sort of what are some resources and responsibilities you know this is a, a screenshot of uh, just a visual of the opioid epidemic you know what you see there is in 1999 the red heat signatures were the you know sort of the opioid deaths that happened in this country and this is 2014 and if you wanted to even take it five years further, you know, our whole country would be red. You know, what we ha what's happening with our, uh, you know, country with the opioid epidemic is just a symptom of the overall problem, though, because we'll talk about that with 72,000 people died in 2017 in America of opioid-related deaths, and that's more Americans than died in the entire Vietnam War. And so that's substantial, and that gets a lot of attention. 
And often we neglect to address that, well shoot, 88,000 Americans died of alcohol-related deaths the same year. And so that opioid epidemic can get a lot of the focus, but if you wanted to look at the wider problem, you know, it's much deeper than that. And it's even much deeper than the substance consumption. You know, unfortunately, there was a, a term that was coined and made popular last year by uh, some researchers at a, uh, Princeton called Deaths of Despair. You know, our country in every state in America, deaths of despair increased in every state. Deaths of despair are considered overdoses, uh, alcohol-related liver deaths, and suicides. And so in every state in America, those deaths increased. And so as a country, we have a deeper problem. You know, suicide rates are increasing in all ages, especially ages 10 to 14 of females. You know, mental health is getting, is getting higher, more acute, and younger. You know, why is this happening? You know, what is the, the root cause of it all? And because we have a deeper issue that, you know, what this says is uh, our country right now is not a happy country. And that's not psychology, that is biology. You know, we know that happy people live longer. We know that. In the 1960s, and ever since the 1960s, America was the leading in foreign, as far as health and, and life expectancy. You know, we've led the charge in the world. Well, what happened last year is for the first time in 100 years, life expectancy in America went down. And so everything that we're seeing and hearing says there is a significant problem that's coming out with the opioid epidemic and the addiction epidemic and suicide rates and life expectancy is going down. There's a root cause that is a lot deeper than what it must appear on the surface. But it's hard to imagine that in a country like America that was once said to be the greatest country in the world, life expectancy is going down. <clears throat> and so if we even want to talk about it more on a local impact and not as global, in North Carolina, overdose deaths increased in all 100 counties. And uh, in 2016, nearly 65 million narcotic pills were prescribed to only six, uh, 16 western counties right here close to Charlotte. Let me remind you that it was now four years ago that our nation's uh, Surgeon General said we were in the worst public health care crisis our country had ever seen four years ago, and we're still having this problem. You know, that's enough pills for every man, woman, and child to have a bottle of 83 narcotic pills. That's absurd. And that was two years after our Surgeon General said we were in the worst public health care crisis. There's a ripple effect also of marijuana legal legalization, and I'm not getting into that argument. That's a, a momentum that's not going to stop. It's going to be legalized all over the country. But the problem with that is that's made marijuana less valuable to the cartels and drug dealers, and so they've gone to other illicits that are more valuable. And so it's pumped more potent, you know, heroin, meth, cocaine, those things into our system because, you know, THC is no longer as valuable to them because you can get it off the Internet legally in other states. And so it's, um, you know, it's made the, you know, illicits more powerful drugs far more prevalent. You know, in North Carolina, four of the North Carolina cities are the top 20 in the nation as far as overdose. Wilmington, Hickory, Jacksonville, and Fayetteville. And even here in Charlotte, uh, you know, we're a hub of activity. Uh, we do a lot of partnerships with Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department. Um, and because of sort of where we are on the coast, our expanding uh, um, airport, I-85, I-40, and I-77, how they can traffic in and out of here. It's a distribution point. And, uh, you know, even when uh, that spills over into Charlotte, you know, we see that in our communities, just not in the communities that the stigma would have us believe. Because Charlotte Mecklenburg and people in this field can tell you, where do you think the most drug busts and the biggest drug problems happen in the Charlotte region? I'm sorry? Audrey Kell High School. Audrey Kell in South Charlotte. Yep. And not just Audrey Kell, because those kids are just a consequence of the problem at home. 
In fact, Audrey Raquel was the first high school we were allowed into. We started going in there uh, last year and having uh, presentations with teachers and parents. The other schools have a hard time letting us in because they would be identified as the drug problem. And even you talk to the superintendent or ex-superintendent, it's like you can't hide that it's happening. It's happening here. But that's where the biggest, uh, the biggest problem is, is in South Charlotte. And Charlotte with a, a population of one million people, even here in this, uh, you know, Charlotte proper, in that year, every man, woman, and infant uh, could have a bottle of 37 narcotic pills. And, you know, uh, when <clears throat> I'm asked to talk about uh, this issue in this, in this region, a lot of people will uh, ask me to come in and talk about strategies to identify or, or help, you know, the children or help the, the kids at Audrey Kell. I mean, we were asked to come in there and to teach the teachers of how to identify strategies of people who are struggling. And of course, that's helpful. And we do that. And it, it helps, uh, you know, with early intervention and treatment. But also, that's, that's just solving the immediate crisis because the solution is at home. You know, the solution is in the system, is what I call it. Because it's a deeper problem, as we talked about, of why all these deaths are happening. I mean, the United States has 4 to 5% of the world's population, and we consume 85 to 90% of the world's pain medicine. Do you think we're the only human beings in pain? You know, do you think or there's a larger problem that's deeper than just figuring out what the opioid epidemic is about? And so what do you think the root of that problem is? <clears throat> the solution is in the system and just to start to identify the environment that we're existing in now. How many of you guys, when you went to school, had active shooter training drills? I didn't. I didn't grow up like that, where kids today have active shooter training drills. How many of you guys grew up with constant 24-hour news about Syria or what's happened around the world at the palm of your hand 24-7? Or every time you turn on the news, there's another mass shooting. I mean, I remember when the first one became prominent, Columbine in 1999. And now it just seems like every time you turn on the TV, the constant stress and trauma that is around us, we've almost gotten uh, desensitized to. I mean, active shooter training drills. As a child, think about that 24 seven stress that's happening to that child. Or what about the sense of community? And I, grew, I was born and raised on the Outer Banks where there was front porches and communities and neighborhoods and we like to talk to each other. But it's not like that anymore. You know, we live in a world where exhaustion is a status symbol, where we get emails on our phones and we're expected, demanded to respond, and we're exhausted. And I'm the same way. I mean, I work all day, and when I drive home, I come down my neighborhood, get into my driveway, open up the garage, shut the door, because hell, if I want to say hello to the neighbor walking her dog, so I just don't have time for that small talk. You know, we don't have that community anymore. It's not there. And no matter if you're from a big city or Los Angeles, you still live within a community. You still live with connection. And we're exhausted. We work all the time and uh, families and, and parents and aren't, aren't home connecting with their own family system and with their children. And technology is a huge problem. And that's not a, a rail against technology because it's enormously helpful. But we are the most connected, disconnected society ever. I mean, how many of you guys, when you have a difficult conversation, you'll send a novella over text? Because you can't have the conversation face to face. Or how many of the people in this room text family members in their own house? In the, in the same room. Or even across the dinner table. I mean, we do that all the time. You know, we say that it's, oh, it's easy and convenient. The truth is that it's really uncomfortable or we're in a vulnerable spot if we go have that conversation face to face. And so it's much easier to text it. What's the problem with that? How is that message received? However, the person reading it in whatever emotional state they're in. 
mean, how many of you guys have even gotten conditioned to put exclamation points or emojis after short words because you don't want the person thinking you're being short? I mean, people ask me a question over text, and I'll respond yes, and I'll get, why are you being so short with me? And I'm like, it's just, it's called text message. It's not text conversation. Same with email. These are rational forms of communication that we're trying to use for emotional mediums of communication. That doesn't go well. It does not go well. <clears throat> I mean, we live in a Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat world, which means we're great at putting filters on things. My life is great. Here's the uh, pictures of us at the Bahamas. Even though we're almost in the middle of a divorce and our family's a wreck and the abuse is going home and it's like we, that disconnect that we show. And we wonder why we raise a generation of kids that don't know how to communicate their emotions. Right? Because that's just avoidance behavior. Because if we're going to talk about the opioid epidemic or the addiction epidemic, you know, a lot of times the, uh, the stigma of that is what prevents us from treating it properly. You know, but that's just avoid its behavior because as a whole, we are the most obese, addicted, medicated, in debt adult society ever. And we wonder why we raise a generation of kids who are starting to use drugs and alcohol at earlier ages. Where do you think they get it from? Where do you think those kids at Audrey Kell get it from? They didn't learn it by themselves. And I hear it all the time, even when I do organizational consulting about the millennial generation, leaders of, the, of tomorrow and how bad they are. I'm like, well, you're the leader of today. Where do you think they're getting it from? All human beings use medicators. Like I said, what, what are those behaviors? Obese, addicted, in debt. Those are all external dopamine-driven medicators, instant gratification. The same reason why we use text instead of having the conversation face-to-face, -face because we cannot be uncomfortable or in a vulnerable, vulnerable spot. So we seek medicators, and those behaviors by themselves aren't unhealthy, it's when they get imbalanced because we're going to talk about that balance in brain chemistry. A lot of people will think this is an addict or alcoholic thing. And I can tell you, we don't even use that vernacular in our treatment because this is just a human being thing. <clears throat> Can't tell you how many families I've talked to like that. You know, they grow up with screens and that's how they communicate. You know, ADHD has increased 76% in 10 years. That's a frontal lobe disorder. You think 76% of the current gener generation's frontal lobes just stopped working? Or do you think they've grown up where people put screens in front of them since they were an infant? Where it says, here comes YouTube, here comes another thing, here comes another link, here comes another link, and suddenly you're down the rabbit hole of, of researching whatever's popping up on your screen, and you wonder why they can't focus? because you know, they got screens and it's disconnecting them and there's no parent home to connect with them and if they are, they'll text them across the room anyway. <clears throat> when we went into around the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and I used to go into high schools, now I go into middle schools because it's just getting younger and I transposed the adults and the students so parents would be in a small group but with children, just not their own so they could actually hear it and parents were baffled that 6th and 7th graders have access to high potency marijuana and prescription drugs more so than they do alcohol. And where do you think they're getting those prescription drugs? From their parents, medicine cabinets. And so you've got high potency chemicals that are available to kids at a younger age when their brains aren't developing, aren't fully developed and they have higher impact. Now, they're also in homes where the divorce rate is skyrocketing. And this is not a knock on the di divorce. Sometimes divorce is healthy. This is a conversation about the absolute lack of co-parenting that can happen with divorce. The absolute lack of co-parenting, which means just adults being mature and putting their child first. Um, that's, not, that's not going on. <clears throat> 
and an, an element that's out of your control and my control also is the healthcare system's gross inability to treat this disease. You know, there's, we see that in all the research that I just showed you at the beginning, that four years after the nation's number one doctor says it's the worst public health care crisis, we still have doctors prescribing all that medication. And they don't know, they're not trying to be harmful. You know, one of the things we also do is that the continuing medical education providers for Atrium and Novant. And I've sat in front of 400 medical school graduates and said, how many of you guys have had one week's worth of training on addiction and nobody raises their hand? You know, sat in front of a room full of psychiatrists and internists and all these doctors and reviewed within this material and it's like the first time they've heard it. And so even our, our state was uh, one of the first to start passing laws to help the opioid epidemic. We passed something called the STOP Act that went live uh, last January that limits the prescription writing uh, length that doctors can prescribe narcotics on the first visit. It went live in January, and in April, I did a CME event for Atrium Novant and the Independent Physicians Association at the Carolinas, and nobody knew the law four months after it went into effect. And psychiatrists are the worst. And I'll tell them that they're the worst because they're the only medical specialists that don't look at or measure the organ they treat. And it's very hard to make diagnoses on 30 minutes once a month when you're talking about a brain disorder. ERs have become dumping grounds because there's not enough resources and they're doing the best they can, but they're overtrained, underwhelmed, and they don't know how to treat it. And then they'll send them to an industry that's operating on treatment modalities that are 20 years old. And we wonder why this epidemic rages out of control. Even with all the news and awareness that we've had the past two years, the statistics that just came out says out of the 30 million people that admit suffering, 10 less than 10% still receive treatment. You know, the healthcare system and general practitioners are the gateway to the overall healthcare system, and they don't understand the disease. In 2010, Columbia University did a study, nine out of 10 didn't know how to treat it, three out of four doctors thought addiction was not a treatable disease. The stigma prevents it from people get, from getting help. You know, the, the bum under the bridge or the junkie in the alley is what we think about. But the reality is 76% of people struggle with substance use disorder have a fully functioning job, 76%. The days of when that was the, the alcoholic was the town drunk under the bridge, then that's what it looks like is grossly inaccurate. And that stigma has a powerful, powerful influence on families and, and people that prevent it from getting help. The legal system has it. We've been punishing and abusing abusers for years. I think we could punish it away. I've been in court before and I've heard a judge tell a person in the court, you know how I know you're an alcoholic because you don't think you are one. I was like, the judge couldn't be more full of shit in her own bias. And that's the truth. That's what she would say to the uh, person struggling. Not that they don't have consequences, they can still have consequences. But that's not gonna help. But that stigma has a powerful, powerful motivator. <clears throat> And also is the reality of the culture we're in now. That's what I say, I tell families, there's no safe experimentation. You know, the days of kids stealing Strawberry Boone's Farm and getting drunk before high school and walking in, as unhealthy as that is, kids today are ordering this stuff off the internet. This is something that was a picture taken in my office that comes in regularly. These are synthetic benzodiazepines and opiates. These were ordered off the internet, shipped to their house within 24 hours in a very nondescript FedEx box. And I think this is Flurbamophamazolam. I can never, I even try to pronounce it, every time I do this, I don't think I've got it right once. But there's a research drugs. There's no governance on them. Shipped to their front door in a little FedEx box. And that's what they're using. You know, one drop of that in a vape. And we hear these stories about these kids who are in comas and stuff like that. And even if one kid knows it's in there and they pass the vape to a friend, 
You know, that's what is impacting these kids these days. I mean, a seasoned person in the industry asked me the other day, when's the last time I saw a like, garden variety alcoholic? And they just don't exist anymore. You know, fentanyl, research drugs, you know, methamphetamine, it's just not the way it was 30, 40 years ago. There's no safe experimentation. So when parents say, well, I used to smoke a joint back in the day and have fun with the hippie lettuce, I'm like, well, that was 10, 15% THC, and now it's coming out with 98, 99% THC, and it has a profound impact on brains. It's a lot different. And it's dangerous, and it's unfortunately is no safe experimentation, and yes, that's unfair, but the fairness is a different discussion. It, just, it is the reality that we're faced with. <clears throat> And so 60% of what we see in ERs is some result of behavioral health or mental illness. In our prisons, or 90% of the prison population suffers from some spectrum of substance use disorder related illness. And when understanding the rest of this conversation, it's really on the basis of one common theme, all human development is how our brains develop. You know, we, and especially the past five to 10 years, we have learned an immense amount of in neuroscience in the field of, of our brain. Because uh, we know that the human brain in the healthiest of environments and the healthiest of circumstances is still developing to the mid to late 20s, 25, 26. It's still in the oven cooking and maturing. And so before that point, the brain is very plastic. It's very influenceable. It's very permeable. That means that things impact the brain, an immature brain, at far profound levels in a mature brain. You know, chemicals cross the blood-brain barrier of adolescence at a higher rate than they do adult, because it's still infant, the brain is still developing. And so you can understand why kids who now have access to more potent drugs at a younger age in an environment that they have research chemicals, and that's what they're consuming. And we wonder why mental health and substance use disorders are skyrocketing out of control at that age. Because we also know that the earlier the introduction of any narcotic or chemical, 20 to 30 more times more likely is that person to develop a substance use disorder later in life. Because it starts to impact the brain development. We know that. And so that's why when parents always tell me, well, I'd like to introduce my child to alcohol before at 18. I said, first, it's against the law, and you're teaching them it's okay to break the law if I'm okay, if I'm okay with it, and you're above the law. Second, that's categorically false. It actually does more harm to introduce it to them earlier, no matter what safe conditions you are putting them in. The earlier the introduction of a chemical, the higher likelihood there is for uh, mental health and substance use disorders later in life. And that plays out because by the age of 24, we can identify probably 75% of mental illnesses because the brain is in its final stages of de development, how it's going to operate in that individual on an organic level. And we can see it. 50% of lifetime cases we can begin to see at 14. That's because from zero to seven and seven to 14 are some key brain development stages. You know, there are some things that you do that if zero to seven, if you don't learn, you won't learn them the rest of your life. You have to experience them as an infant. You know, that's how we grow and we learn in this world is through experience, is through caregivers, through human touch. It's not psychology, it's biology. That's how we learn to, uh, the metaphor I give is a firecracker puppy. That if you had a litter of puppies, same DNA, and one gets adopted to a family that loves it and feeds it and takes care for it, and one gets adopted to a family that throws firecrackers by it many times a day, how do you think they're going to grow up differently? In your brain, there's certain things that if it doesn't learn, like language, it's much easier to teach a uh, child language, and I have... Uh, three nieces and nephews that are all bilingual because they grew up and, and they learned it like that in two years at age four to six. And I spent four years on it in high school and college and I, don't, I can barely say, oh, I won. But they were introduced to it at an earlier age and their brain can adapt. It's very plastic. It can, it can be impacted positively or negatively. And so when you're looking about how to treat it and somebody's using substances, you've got to understand a lot of their history, trauma history, how they grew up. You know, if they grew up in a family of, they had alcoholic parents and their needs weren't met, 
that's gonna impact their behaviors later on in their brain development. And we can see that in how we can even identify the measurables of people. <clears throat> And this is also a, a, an illness that, because of that stigma we talked about that drives people back in the shadows, that they're the ones suffering and uh, suffering alone. But the reality is we all know people, and if we're really honest, probably directly in our family that have been impacted by mental illness or substances. 25% of adults experience mental illness, like clinical depression, worldwide. That makes it the leading cause of medical disability yet we're still afraid to talk about it. Still afraid to admit to get help. And the measurables we see is, like I said, it's not psychology, it's biology and it's fact. 14% of, in the, the 14 of our population, 14 to 17% experience some spectrum of substance use disorder. We do know it's a brain disease. You know, the odds of having another addictive disorder along with that are seven times higher. Why do you think that is? like gambling addiction, sex addiction, those are real things. Why do you think that is? Because it's a brain disease, it's not a choice, and those are things like the most obese, addicted, medicated, in debt, those process, they're also dopamine-driven behaviors, and when your brain is changed, it's what they say, you're a pickle, never be a cucumber again. You know, your brain gets used to it. It's called procedural learning, actually, in neuroscience. You know, there are parts of what we learn that's called procedural learning, it means it's something that you can't unlearn, your brain can't unlearn it, like riding a bike. I haven't ridden a bike in 20 years, but if you bought a beach cruiser in here with a nice pink basket, I could hop on it and still ride it, because your brain doesn't forget that. Substance use disorders, like addiction uh, behaviors, are the same thing to the brain. They are classified as procedural learning, and your brain cannot unlearn those. Well, it's like, great, well, how do we treat it? Well, you can still treat it. You just have to learn to develop healthy procedural learning habits to combat it. And that's neuroplasticity and neuroscience, and that's what takes time and consistency, not 28 days. It's procedural learning. You know, among those with having an alcohol disorder, 44% have a co-occurring mental health, and among those with a drug disorder, 53% have another disorder. Co-occurring, uh, co-occurring dual diagnosis, comorbid conditions all mean the same thing, that there's an addiction, substance use disorder going on, and then there's an organic mental illness that goes along with it. Something else that's going along uh, by it, the common term now is dual diagnosis because most professionals get tunnel vision on the chemical consumption, and I can tell you that's the easiest part to stop. If that's all we needed to treat this condition, prisons would work. They don't. You know, overall, treating, the, treating this disease, is, as we'll find out, is much more about treating the underlying condition. Like, what is the root cause of them using that? Like, what is the root cause of our adult society being the most addicted, obese, medicated, and debt society? What's the root cause? And the reason why there's, there's such a substantial statistical difference between alcohol and drugs is there is some difference in that chemical. Because I've met plenty of alcoholics that drank for 30 or 40 years. I have not met many IV heroin addicts that lasted for 30 or 40 years. I have not met many meth addicts that kept that going 30 or 40 years. Chemical, chemicals these days have profound impact on people's brains and it, it can affect them more se severely. <clears throat> and the difference between the choice versus disease component. Because despite being accepted with the medical community decades ago as a disease, we still have a problem today. I would, uh, on the first, I would used to run the Betty Ford Family Center, and it was a five day family program. And on the first day, I'd ask every family in the room, How many of you guys think this is a disease? And everybody would raise their hand. And I'd say, come on now, how many, how many of you guys are just raising your hand because you'd look like a jackass if you didn't? And half the hands went down. And I said, that's what this is for. It's for you to ask your questions and it's the safety of this room. Because whatever would come out, whether it was a choice or willpower or 
I stopped it. Whatever reason they had, it all boiled down to human behavior. It can't be a disease. It's human behavior. So, okay, well, let's go along that route because why can't human behavior be a disease? You know, our, our society has no problem accepting coronary artery disease as a disease. There's no problem accepting diabetes 2 as a disease. Both of those can be brought on by unhealthy human behavior. If you don't eat right, you don't exercise, your body can biologically shift and you can develop coronary artery disease. If you don't eat right, you don't exercise, your body can biologically shift and you can develop diabetes. Not everybody who doesn't eat right and doesn't exercise, but those who have predisposition and exposure or higher likelihood. So what's the difference with addiction? 10 people have a beer, one is going to, the brain's gonna shift and develop addiction. The only difference is the impact is in the brain. And instead of symptoms looking like high blood pressure or sugar issues, the brain is responsible for decisions. It looks like poor decisions. And we classify that as character issue. But it's the same thing. Your heart, ability to produce insulin, and your brain. We still have a problem accepting it as a disease. Still to this day. <clears throat> You know, we know genetics are involved. You know, it's a matter of predisposition, exposure, genetics, how you were raised. We know, we know the general addictive genes and where they are in the brain. <clears throat> you know, one of the most important things that it's uh, for professionals and families that come into our office is for them to understand the, the general concept of how to even start treatment because there's amount of gross information, misinformation out there. The biggest error that I see, whether it's professionals, healthcare professionals, people who are in recovery themselves, that I hear them tell other people, is you really have to want it to get better, or you have to hit rock bottom to get better, which both are categorically false, and actually harmful to tell somebody. And the reason for that is, Substances of abuse affect the body differently initially. We've all heard of uppers and downers. Some people like to go fast with cocaine speed, meth, Adderall, Ritalin, those chemicals that are excitatory toward the chemical, I mean toward the brain. And don't get me started on Adderall, that's one molecule off of meth methamphetamine. And we're giving it to kids. But some people like to go fast and some people like to go slow with downers like uh, marijuana, opiates, alcohol, benzodiazepines like Xanax, Valium, you know, that are GABA synergistic is what it's called, that are downers. Affect the body differently initially, uppers and downers. But in the end and in the long run, all of those chemicals affect the body and the brain the same way. And they shut off or severely diminish the activity in the frontal cortex. And why is that important to our conversation or what presents in your office or what presents in professional's office? is the frontal cortex is what controls executive functioning, common sense, personality, rational thinking, impulse control, long-term thought, empathy, personality, ethics, spirituality. So everything that makes somebody an individual and human is not working properly. You know, our frontal cortex is what separates us from reptiles. That reptilian brain that we learned in ninth grade, that fight or flight part of our brain of the limbic system, Frontal cortex is what makes us human. It's also why, like, unlike reptiles, and we don't eat our young, even though sometimes we want to. It's because we have a frontal cortex. We're just not, input, not built off of fight or flight, fight or flight. But all those chemicals shut that off. So their brain's not working, and yet we'll still tell them they really have to want it. It's like they don't have a working brain that's like asking somebody in a wheelchair to get up and sprint across the room, their body's just not capable of it right now. You know, we'll also tell them they are in denial. And so you can't help them. It's like, well, denial is a symptom of a disease. That's like saying, I can't help you with pneumonia because you got a 106 degree temperature. I'm gonna wait until that temperature comes down to 98 before I start treating it. Doesn't make any sense, but that's what we'll tell people. And I'll clarify that. I mean, I, I tell people that if somebody's gonna live a lifetime of healing and healthy decision-making and recovery, yes, they're gonna to have to want it. Yes, they're gonna to have to be motivated. Yes, they're gonna to have to have that internal change and, and desire to want it. But not in the beginning. Not when their brain is not working properly. When it's not, not functioning properly, they can't do it. And all our science and medical research tells us that. 
It's actually called behavioral activation. Like you're, you're, that's the most proven modality we have at treating this, means your motivation doesn't matter. You can act your way into healthier brain functioning. Because I'll tell family, motivation going into treatment has zero bearing on overall outcome. That's why working with the legal system can be so helpful because treatment to be successful does not have to be voluntary. Because compliance is all I care about in the beginning. It's called behavioral activation, like you can act your way into healthier thinking despite motivation. Think about depression. Let's just put substances on the shelf. When you're depressed, you want to stay in the house, lie on the couch, you don't want to socialize, you don't want to go out in the sun, you don't want to exercise. And, but if you force yourself to do it, if you force yourself to go outside, if you force yourself to engage, if you force yourself to get off the couch, you can act your way into healthier brain functioning. It's called behavioral activation. In fact, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, that Ivy League school, they're a medical school, so the UPenn Medical School, their entire medical school motto, send the body, the brain will follow. It's all about really leverage to get them in to comply long enough for their brain to heal, and then they want it. And those of you who are familiar with the 12 steps, they've been saying that since the beginning. They just didn't realize it. They stumbled upon it. Because they'll come in here and say, fake it until you make it. Which means come in here and comply until your brain heals. And then you'll want it. That's also why you hear them say there's a, surrender, a, a sober date and a surrender date. Two different things. But we'll tell a family they really have to want it to get better, which is false. Or they tell them you have to hit rock bottom to hit better. What other disease would we treat that way? That we wouldn't tell them you have to wait to the highest level of acuity or highest level of severity before we can treat you? Can you imagine if we treated cancer that way? I know we caught this and identified it stage one, but why don't you go back out there, have a good time, maybe lie in some sun a bit, eat some fast food and come back out here when it's stage four, really difficult to treat, really costly, really hurtful, really painful, prognosis is worse, and that's when we'll start. This is just like any other disease. The earlier the intervention, the earlier the treatment, the higher the prognosis. It's just like any other disease. Nobody wants treatment. You guys can probably hear some of the striations in my voice and breathing. It's because at 18, right before I was supposed to go to Chapel Hill to play basketball, I was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease. Six months later, breathing out of a trach in an oxygen tank, given two years to live and 87 surgeries at the Mayo Clinic to keep me alive. I didn't want any of them. When they asked me to, if you want that trach in, I said no. I don't. You can't put that in my parents made me comply. And I'm alive. And it made me angry. And I was frustrated. And it was unfair. It was costly. It was out of network. It was out of pocket. Chemo and radiation sucked. And it was still the appropriate path to save my life. And somehow we've lost that with this disease. Even though it kills more people in America than the Vietnam War did. <clears throat> and so when thinking about the brain disease, you know, th this is the area of the brain that the disease affects, that limbic system. The reward area, feel-good area that regulates emotions, motivations, you know, related to survival, fear, anger, pleasure, drugs, alcohol, sex. You know, this is where the, uh, that's your reptilian brain. That's your frontal cortex, the executive branch that's responsible for controlling impulses, judgment, reason, problem solving, rational decision making, insight, impulse control, ability to organize thoughts and plan for the future. That's not working and we'll ask them to want it to get better. It's impossible, it's actually unfair. That's why one of the most common statements I hear families make is I just want my loved one back. I just want my husband back. I just want my son back. It's like invasion of the body snatchers, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's because the part of the brain that makes them individuals not working. That's why. <clears throat> you know, this limbic area, this is where, when that dominates the judgment area because even in the healthiest brain, the limbic system was designed to overpower the frontal cortex. Fight or flight. And so in this situation where you have a minimized frontal cortex and a hyperactivated limbic system, it's really going to overpower it. 
less planned thinking, more impulsive, less self-control, high risk takers. I mean, we can even identify the areas of the brain that certain chemicals affect. And we still have a problem understanding it's a brain disease. <clears throat> so they really have to want it. That's why a lot of my clients, the legal system clients, are the, are the best ones because I have leverage to keep them in treatment. And all of our success rates that we know of point to this, and this is important because this material is not just psychobabble, it's evidence-based science. Because I'll get asked a lot about success rates. And you know, the, the part of healthcare is good, bad, or indifferent because of the Affordable Care Act and, and something called the Addiction and Mental Health Parity Act that both went into effect in 2013. Many uh, people get access to insurance and now they, can, they have to treat this disease and they can't deny it from pre-existing condition. And so insurance become a big part of the, the industry allowing more people to get access to services. But insurance became a big part of the industry and they want metrics. They want data, and so they want to understand now uh, if there's success rates. And if anybody tells you a success rate for their treatment center, they're lying to you, because we don't know that yet. It's the hottest topic in our industry. I mean, how do you judge success? It's not like a broken leg or you can pull out a pathogen. I can show an x-ray and show objective success. I mean, how do you show success with sobriety? If somebody goes into a treatment center, completes it, and stays sober for a month or relapses for two weeks, but then stays sober the rest of their life, is that a success? I mean, it would be to me, but as far as measurable. If somebody goes into a treatment center, stays sober for a year, relapses a weekend, and then stays sober the rest of their life, is that a success? So how to judge success, we're still trying to figure that out. <clears throat> there is one demographic that we know very well, thanks in part to attorneys, I work with Kathy Killian, the Legal uh, Assistance Program, the North Carolina Physicians Health Program, pilots, doctors, lawyers, those people that have licenses or are responsible for public health. And you just can't get caught getting drunk and fly a 747 the next day. They just don't let you do that. As you guys know that you have to enter diversion programs. And a lot of those diversion programs work with all over the state. We have data. A lot of the states, you have five to seven years you have to enter this program. You have to comply with the treatment recommend, recommendation. And you have to be monitored. And like with uh, Joe Jordan, the North Carolina Physicians Health Program, you get monitored once a week plus 10%. That means that for that sneaky doctor who thinks he's smart, that if he tests on a Monday and he thinks he's got a week until he tests again, there's always a 10% chance he can test the next day. And so we've got this data for five to seven years that says 90% are, su are successfully sober at the end of five to seven years, 90%. And the people that test positive one time, 92 or 3% are sober seven years after their first positive test, which is polarizingly higher than the general population, which is probably like seven to 14%. And that shouldn't be, because I can create the same treatment plan for the attorney or the doctor as I can the 44-year-old chef. I can create the same one. One will have 90%, one will have seven to 14%. The only controllable difference is family. And I usually was like, what? So the only controllable difference is family. Because over here in the diversion program, even though a lot of people will say, well, that's because they have a high priced law degree or medical degree over their head. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, but the same statistic is true for the stewardess that makes $32,000 a year and the dental hygienist that makes $28,000 a year. The same 90% success rate is true. So that's not accurate. The only difference is they are forced to comply. Joe Jordan does not care if that doctor wants treatment, does not care if he admits he is, has a problem, does not care what the family's emotions about it or what the stigma says. You are forced to comply. And if you don't do it, you won't get your license and that's it. Compliance, motivation is not factored in. When I'm dealing with anybody else but that, I'm entirely dependent on the family because in the beginning, that person's brain is not gonna be able to make that healthy decision. I'm entirely dependent on the family to hold boundaries, to force compliance as long as it possibly can. Because if you let somebody whose brain is not working 
But the part of the brain that is working is telling them they need something that's harmful to survive. If you let that brain make the decisions, it's not going to go well, 7 to 14%. And so I'm entirely dependent on the diversion program. I'm de entirely dependent on how much educational therapy can I get the people that are around the client. Or we regularly work with legal offices to help with compliance and leverage all the time to get treatment rather than punishment and enforce long-term compliance. Because neuroplasticity, the retraining of the brain's pathways, how long it takes to heal, is longer than 28 days. Procedural learning, developing those competing uh, healthy procedural learning habits is longer than 28, 90 days. This is a brain scan of, all you have to see here is this is a colorful, active, healthy brain. This is the brain activity of somebody 10 days sober. This is the brain activity of somebody 100 days off of chemicals. So after they've completed a 90-day treatment spectrum, this is their level of brain functioning. Would you trust that brain to have any influence over your life or death treatment plan? And so why would we let it have any influence over what's best for them? Also, what's also grossly misunderstood is the dual diagnosis part of this. This is what a brain looks like when it's experienced clinical depression. I mean, how can you tell the difference between that brain and that brain an hour a week, 30 minutes once a month, like psychiatrists see? The complexities of treating this, you need long-term professional lens on people when the brain, how does it come back? I can't tell you how many people I've seen in my career that a week coming off of meth and Xanax, a psychiatrist just diagnosed them as bipolar, and I'm like, I'd be a little up and down too if I'm drunk or on Valium and taking meth. I would be a little bipolar. But you've got to wait until the brain heals. How does it function organically to really understand what's driving that current? And it's not exclusive, like I said, the substances of abuse affect the body differently initially, but in the end they affect the body the same way. These are all the drugs of choice, cocaine, meth, alcohol, heroin, all the same impact on the limbic system of the brain. Trust me, drug of choice doesn't matter in how we treat it. If that worked, we would separate treatment centers. There's a cocaine treatment center, that's an alcohol treatment center. It doesn't affect it. It does affect the stigma of it, though. That's why we don't allow emotions to drive an objective healthcare treatment plan. And there's always somebody in the audience that wants to argue how marijuana is healthier. It's not. This is an evidence of how marijuana does the same thing to the brain. And there's always somebody that wants to say, yeah, but that will help with the opioid epidemic. So that's not what evidence says, because in the state of Colorado, medicinal marijuana has been legal for 15 years. Last year, they still had the second highest opioid overdose rate in the country. So obviously, that doesn't stop that. It's not a substitution, it's a partner drug. And this is evidence that there's a lot of hope out there. This is evidence of that 90% success. This is 14 months of abstinence and the brain's finally starting to come back. Finally starting to come back. So I tell families it takes two years to stabilize this process. Certain, certainly not 30, 60, 90 days. It's certainly not like the famous movie 28 Days with Sandra Bullock where she enters a place for 28 days, pets a horse and picks up a hoof and she's cured. It's just not how it works. It's uncomfortable. It's unfair. It's costly. It takes a long time. It's boring. Healing the brain is about consistency, procedural learning, not intensity. You know, what I mean by that is you know, us who have those New Year's resolutions that end in about a, have probably already ended or only lasted about a week or two. You don't get shape, get, you don't get in shape by going to the gym 48 hours in a row. You get in, get in shape by going to the gym one hour a day, consistently every day. And so that's what treatment takes. Neuroplasticity, the retraining of the brain's pathways. Functional neurobiology, it takes consistency and repetition. And there's somebody saying, well, I've heard all this before. I've been there before, I don't need it. I said, and that's what it takes. That's true, and that's what it takes. <clears throat> there's somebody also that says in that Betty Ford family program, Ward, I understand it's a disease. I understand they put that chemical in them and brain changes, 
but there's always somebody in there, well, my spouse was 20 years sober and they picked up again and that was a choice. So no, not really, because what this shows is this is the same individual, he's 10 years sober, and they show him a nature video and his limbic system does not light up. They show him a video of his drug of choice and his limbic system lights up like a Christmas tree. Procedural learning, your brain never unlearns it. That's also why you hear in the recovery uh, uh, arena when people relapse, the relapse happened well before the first drink. That's because they stopped doing what kept them healthy before they drank again. That means they stopped their consistent procedural learning and then they, that trigger or the craving was able to overpower what they had stopped doing. Because not everybody, didn't mean that you're going to 20 years sober, you're going to experience a craving and then bolt off out of control because you're developing procedural learning habits. But if you stop doing that, and then there's that shift, because that will always be there, then you don't have that healthy competing lear learning. And that's where that happens. It's called the science of triggers, when you're a pickle never to be a cucumber again. And that's just a reality. So I said, well, that stinks. I said, well, yeah, well, this is a healthcare crisis. You know, as a result of, as you can see, that, I, like the doctor said, I did not die in two years. But I have to take 12 immunosuppressant pills every day. It's not my fault that that happened. It's my responsibility to do that every day. And that's just the way it is. It's like when somebody comes into an ER and they get diagnosed with diabetes and it's like, God, that stinks. But if you eat right and you exercise and you take your insulin every day, chances are this is not going to be a major influence in your life. It's not his fault, but it's his responsibility. So if he comes back a year later and you have to amputate his foot, did you eat right? Nope. Did you exercise? Nope. Did you take your insulin every day? Nope. It's like, well, no wonder. It's the same way. When somebody's diagnosed with this, health healthcare crises are unfair. It's not their fault. It doesn't remove responsibility. They still have to do what they have to do to survive. And how does this, you know, that, all that is sort of the, the medical disease model of uh, how the disease affects somebody's brain and body, how does that present that what do human beings experience is it affects people's lives in four main areas of behavior, like what we see. I mean, we don't, unless you know something I don't, you're not walking around with a portable pocket MRI that you can scan people's brain. And so how do you, how does it, how do you see it? How do you experience it? You know, it affects people in four main areas. Their spiritual health is the first thing to go. And they say, well, I'm not religious. Or I said, I'm not talking about that. Your frontal cortex is responsible for connection, for empathy, of idea that there's something outside yourself. It's not psychology, it's biology. Serotonin and oxytocin, those are chemical, required chemicals for brain development. They come with outside connection. They go away when something blocks them like substance. It's the first thing to go. Emotional health is the second thing to go. I mean, these chemicals work. Pain medicine works. Alcohol works. It anesthetizes emotion. That's what it's there for. Why do you think happy hour is so popular? And why do you think it's between five and six? Because people go to de-stress after work to anesthetize emotions. Alcohol by itself isn't unhealthy. It's the imbalance of alcohol. So I'm not saying it doesn't work, but if you use long enough, just like those external medicators of the most obese, addicted, medicated, in debt society, we're just treating emotions, using something external to treat, not feel something internal. But with addiction, if you do that compulsive behavior ongoing, your emotional health suffers. That's why when we, if any of you know anybody that has struggled with this, personally and professionally, sometimes it's like talking to a teenager, regardless of their age. Because if we grow and we learn through experiences in this world, and there's plenty of people that started drinking 16, 17, 18, that for the next 30 years may not have 30 days of sobriety since they were 14. It's very common. And so if they're always sort of, if their reality is sort of skewed, if they're always treating emotions and experiencing them anesthetized, do they ever experience authentic emotion? No. And that means their emotional maturity part of their brain is underdeveloped. And that's why you look, sometimes you're talking to a 50-year-old, 14-year-old. 
when I can't tell you, there's, I was with a, a couple years ago, I was with a, a 44 year old mom and a couple kids and dad in treatment and she stood on top of the chair when, in, when the kids were telling her that they wanted her to do aftercare, saying, no, 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 I'm not doing it. And she started drinking when she was 12 and hadn't, hadn't stopped. And that was a 12 year old sitting on that chair because their emotional health hadn't healed and hadn't, it's that's how we grow and we learn in this world. Third thing to go is their mental health. If you use long enough, it has brain impact, your cognition starts to be impacted. That's why if you drink long enough, they will call it neurotoxicity, blackouts. And the last thing to go is your body's an amazing organ. It can take a lot of drinking and a lot of punishment before it finally gets out, gives out and your liver starts to fail. And, and so that's how untreated active uh, substance use disorder and addiction, how we see it. And the maniacal part about it and why it's so difficult to treat and why working with attorney groups and court systems that can have leverage is how it comes back. It comes back in reverse. Physical health is the first thing to come back. As a clinical interventionist for 15 years, when I intervene and put somebody into treatment and have to send them off, you know, they'll go off for a month and they'll stop drinking two meals and eat three meals a day and maybe they'll get a little bit of sleep, maybe they'll give, be given some trazodone to get some sleep and maybe they'll get to go to the gym and maybe it's a place with sun and they'll get a little bit of a tan and go through detox in seven days. And so within a couple weeks, they may not be feeling great, but they're feeling better than they've felt in years. And then family will come and visit three days later and see their loved one and say, I got him back. He doesn't, we don't need to do what the professionals say. He's here and he's promised me he'd never do it again because the second thing to come back is his mental health. That you start remembering those blackouts, you start kind of recalling things. If you're in an appropriate place, they start treating dual diagnosis. So it means some of your mental health is starting to come back. And that is good that they come back, but the problem is the two most important parts of the healing somebody, don't come back for a long time. Take a while to get coping mechanisms of neuroplasticity and procedural learning healed and developed. And the essence of your frontal cortex coming back takes a long time. And those are the two most important things. And this is what happens as people start feeling better and start thinking for themselves. And that's when they stop listening to professionals. And this is just like any other healthcare condition. Follow the doctor's recommendation. Prognosis is better than if you Google WebMD or decide you know better. And so as a result, families and people around this person come in trauma bonded onto the patient. Trauma bonded onto the patient. That family's life revolves around that one person. They are addicted to that one person. It is trauma bonded to that one person. And that's not intent, they're not, trying to be, they're not trying to be unhealthy, that is just the way human beings are wired. We're wired, that is traumatic. Having a loved one struggle with untreated substance abuse and trying to get help unsuccessfully is traumatic for family members. You know, after I got through that medical crisis, it was right in the early 2000s when the epidemic of the medical community hearing that OxyContin was not addictive, and I was prescribed loads of pain medicine and I got addicted. And I, we, my family had all the resources in the world in Eastern North Carolina and found no one that knew how to help us and I struggled. And so when it got to be its worst, my mother called my house every morning at 6.30 a.m. And I thought she was just being the overbearing mother that she still is. But when I got in this family sort of recovery process and treated it with evidence-based treatment that we're gonna talk about, I learned that she was just calling to see if I was alive at 6.30 at morning every day. And that wasn't a hyperbolic reaction because my, the, the severity of my disease had gotten so bad she had valid reason to wonder day in and day out if I was alive. The mortality level concern of a parent day in and day out. And I don't know of any other scenario in life other than having a loved one deployed to war. And I'm not comparing war and addiction, I'm just comparing what your loved ones experience where they have valid reason and stress and anxiety to wonder if you are alive or not. Don't you think that's dramatic? Your trauma doesn't have to be a lightning bolt, a car crash, or one event. Death by a thousand cuts is still a death. And so people come trauma bonded onto this. And when they say it's a family disease, you have to treat the family. Usually we don't explain much more than that. We tell them to read a book about codependency and go to Al-Anon and good luck. 
but that's not really understanding the science of what happens to even to their brains, because if you're gonna treat this effectively, you've gotta understand that too, and that's rarely ever done. Trauma bonded. They come in here and say, fix them. We don't need to do that family stuff. You know, they'll come in here and they'll point at the kid in Audrey Keller. They'll, if you work with adolescents, they'll point at the adolescent like it's the nine-year-old's problem. Fix that. She's cutting herself, and it's her fault. If you fix her, we'll get better. It's like, it's terrible. It's, it's inaccurate. <clears throat> and so the object of treatment is to sort of understand the systemic impact, and that is not psychology, it is biology. What I say is identified patients are not alone. All human beings are chemically dependent. All human beings, not ones with substance use disorders. And so what do I mean by that? Is we have to take it back even a step. And this circles back to what we talked about at the very beginning. Why are we the most addicted, obese, medicated, in debt society ever? Why are deaths of despair going up? Why do we have four to five percent of the world's population and consume 80 to 90 percent of the world's pain medicine? Why? <clears throat> so our bodies and brains were built to survive. That is why they were designed going back to homo sapien times. They were built to survive. In our body, we employ a system of networks. And why were we the one, the species to survive? Going back to homo sapien times, why did we survive? Because we are not the smartest and we are not the strongest. We know that. What was it about our species that not only did we survive, but we thrived? Look at the world we built. Because we are social creatures. We have to have each other. We have to work together to survive. It is in our biology. That's how that happened. Because if we think about it, human behavior is not that uh, unpredictable. Most of our behaviors are driven by just four main chemicals. Just four main chemicals. Endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. I call endorphins and dopamine the selfish chemicals. What, I mean is, what, what you mean by that is you don't have to have other people to get those. You can get those by yourself. And serotonin and oxytocin, you have to have these chemicals for healthy brain development and healthy physical development. But you need other people to have these. You need other people to have these. And so your life is about a balance of these. It's not that unpredictable. So endorphins, they are built for one purpose and one purpose only, a response to pain. They are built for endurance. If you think about it, the endorphins come with like a runner's high. I don't know if there's any runners out there. I'm allergic to running, but I don't know if there's any running out there. Those marathoners run 19 miles. You run, you run, you run. You get that runner's high because you run that long, you're tearing your muscles. But you feel great, you feel great. You hit the finish line, you feel great. And you feel six hours later. It's like, Ugh. Endorphins are made to get a quick response to pain. They're actually made because for endurance. Back in caveman days, we could track a saber-toothed tiger for hours. We weren't faster than him, but we had more endurance. And it's built for that. And if you want to know the neuroscience of it, endorphins are peptides that activate the opioid receptors. So it's your body's pain medicine. That's what it's there for. Laughter also produces endorphins. If you think about it, have you ever you guys laugh so hard it hurt? You laugh, 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 and stop, stop, it hurts. It's because you're convulsing your organs. Endorphin, endorphin, it goes away, it hurts. And so that's laughter, it feels good. Endorphins. Thunder, relief, stress, anxiety, and depression. Dopamine. That is what I call society's nemesis. It is there to motive us, motivate us and to help us get things done. That's what that is there for. How many of you guys have to-do lists, like write to-do lists? I'm one of those people, and you love crossing that stuff off. Cross it off, cross it off, because there are things that I will do during the day that aren't on my list that once I do them, I'll write them on the list just so I can cross it off. And you know people that do that, because it feels good to get it done. That's also why they say you must write down your goals. We're visual creatures, because we, back in the caveman days, we couldn't wait until we got hungry to go out and get food, because food is, produces dopamine, right? Food, sex, technology, or dopamine producing things. 
Because if we waited until we got hungry, there was no guarantee that we got food. So even the perception of a dopamine-driven behavior can drive dopamine. That's why people experience triggers and cravings. Even the perception of the event, and it's like if you're walking down the road, you see an apple tree, you're like, I gotta hit a dopamine, no, go to that, and gotta hit a dopamine, go to that, and finally get, it helps us get things done. It's also why I say modern times, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry, because you'll buy everything in the store. That's also why you can't put down your cell phone, because they, those cell phones were designed to be dopamine driven. It's actually called the gamification of technology. That's why we hate email, but we love the buzz, the ding that comes with the text message. So it makes us feel good. That's why we count the likes and count the followers, because each one of those is a hit of dopamine. <clears throat> it's very short term. That's what it's there for. Sex, gambling, technology, drugs, alcohol. And that's not saying eating isn't bad, obviously, or gambling isn't bad, or alcohol or technology, but too much that when it gets imbalanced and becomes dopamine-driven compulsion, your brain can actually learn, I need this behavior to survive. And what happens when we have dopamine-driven behaviors? It shuts off your frontal cortex. Kind of relationships and money goes by the wayside because you lose that empathy in the frontal cortex and you're only driven by that compulsion. I mean, ask any gambling addict, an alcoholic addict, how's their relationships and resources? And probably not that good because that long-term planning and rational thinking isn't working. Dopamine is very short term. You can get it by yourself. You don't need anybody. Long term fulfillments aren't there. You don't want the frontal cortex, which is long term consequences, not working properly. This is about survival, not long term wellness. Survival, it's like that's the area of the brain these chemicals affect, that survival part. The other anecdote I give is when I was born and raised on the Outer Banks and I was a lifeguard, and every summer they would teach us every summer that when you go out to save the tourists that shouldn't have been swimming in the water, we told them not to, that they will try to pull us under, or they may try to pull us under when we go out to try to save them from drowning. Are they, in try, are they trying to intentionally trying to murder us? No. Do we try them for attempted murder? No. But their body's just kicking in for survival. It's the same area of the brain that addiction affects. And so when they lie, cheat, and steal to do whatever they can to get that chemical, their body's teaching them that's what they have to survive. They're not intentionally trying to be bad people. That's what their body's, a lot, a lot like that drowning tourist. But we don't treat them the same way. Because that survival mechanism that kicks in, if it gets imbalanced, it reinforces harm. Too much gambling, too much technology, too much sex, too, too much alcohol and drugs, that's when it starts to become unhealthy. And there's no fulfillment, and it comes at the cost of resources, relationships, self-esteem because of shame and guilt, because you know these behaviors are bad, but you can't stop them and you don't know why, and so you're ashamed of it. And so not only does it become imbalanced, but it also reinforces the demise of two very important chemicals. Serotonin was, is the one that's the selfless chemical. We are social by instinct. We must have trust, love, and belonging, connection, and empathy to survive. That is not psychology. That is biology. Self-esteem, esteemable acts, feelings of healthy pride, confidence boosting, gratitude, sunlight. We, it's often a leadership chemical. If any of you guys are those leadership gurus, like whether it's Maxwell or Simon Sinek or Brene Brown, they all teach this same thing. It's all about these two chemicals, serotonin and oxytocin. These are the people we're attracted to in life. When we respect ourselves, when we respect others, we have an increase of serotonin. We can measure this. That when you have low serotonin, you have to, it's a high likelihood of depression. That's why our antidepressants are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, meaning it keeps more serotonin in your synapses. Like I said, this is not psychology, this is biology. Self-worth and compassion for others. It reinforces that, like I said, leadership. Serotonin reinforces like the mentor to mentee, the coach relationship, the sponsor relationship. It reinforces that. Health, there is things of healthy pride. That's also why there's a YouTube that went viral from a general at a commencement that says if you want to be successful in this world, start by making your bed. You start doing esteemable acts. 
It's also the flip side of that. It's why we have an epidemic of failure to launch in this world. Because you got parents still doing things for 30-year-old people that they can be doing for themselves. It robs them of the opportunity to do esteemable acts and actually hurts their brain functioning. Do you think a 30-year-old who's still allowing his parents to do everything deep inside feels confident and no, they're ashamed. And it robs them of that opportunity. Loneliness and depression has low serotonin, we know that. There's a great research article that just came out out of Yale that talks about gratitude increases gray matter and, and functioning in the brain, measuring 5,000 people who just did gratitude lists. And measuring cortisol and, level, and serotonin levels, it's not, it is science. Gratitude activates areas of social and moral cognition, empathy and judgment. That's what serotonin does, it, it controls those, it's a mechanism that controls your dopamine, but if that is imbalanced and you don't have much of it, it doesn't, doesn't work. Even what's called the hypothalamus is at the base of the brain, it regulates survival and critical functioning. Just letter writing, and this is called gratitude letter writing, has a substantial increase of neurological, neurological modulation. What that means is gratitude and happiness, we live longer. And that's why America has a life expectancy going down. And why we're the most obese, addicted, and medicated, and dead society ever. Because we're all driven by dopamine behaviors. Bigger, better, faster, right now. Don't ask me to lean into the discomfort. Don't ask me, just give me a pill to fix it, or just give me a strategy to fix it. <clears throat> and the most important chemical we need to exist is oxytocin. It's actually people's favorite chemical to a healthy brain. It's often called the cuddle chemical. It comes with childbirth, attachment, friendship, love, trust, connection. The science of this is childbirth. That's why when, when the birth of a child, the mother has an unbelievable upshoot of oxytocin that the baby has too, that the dad doesn't have. That's why there's an immediate connection that the mom has that the dad doesn't have yet. And if we're honest with ourselves, dads, because I know your lives for a living as a therapist, you'll come into the office and be like, I love the baby, but it just eats and shits, and I don't feel like the way that he does, and I, and I don't feel this way. But it takes time for you to develop that. We get it. We get it. We absolutely get it. But oxytocin doesn't come immediately. You've got to develop the relationship that the mother and the child have immediately. They have this bond that is inseparable, that it just takes a little bit for the dad to get. It comes with childbirth, attachment, friendship, love, trust, human touch, increases oxytocin. That's why if you watch sports and you'll hear people say, that team is together and cohesive teamwork. And they're all chest bumping and high-fiving and slapping rear ends and holding each other. It's a part of it. If you saw a team that didn't do that, you'd look at a bunch of individuals. Or how about even in business? If you're working hard on a negotiation, sacrifice and put the contract down, sign it, you'd stick out your hand and say, it's nice doing business with you. And they say, hey, nope, I'm good. Let's just, I'm not going to shake your hand. We're just going to go. You would not trust them. We just wouldn't. There's just something about that. We need that. It's also when you're talking about doing therapy and when people enter small groups, when they come in there, they don't immediately get open and vulnerable. Because primal needs are to feel safe, secure, and connected. And it isn't until they get to know the people in the group that trust is established that then they get open and vulnerable. It's because that's what happens. Trust, oxytocin, fulfillment, relationships. We have to have those to survive. Have to have them. That's why if an infant does not experience healthy attachment with his parent, Two distant parents, they have emotional problems, ability to read emotion and social problems because they don't understand. Their brain didn't get that. We have to have oxytocin to survive. And the problem is if you're dopamine driven behavior, you're driving your healthy relationships away. Right? You isolate. That's also why 12 steps, why the fellowship is so important, why they hold hands at the end of the meeting. And when they say, be of service, we'll keep it going. Gratitude. Because isn't that contagious? Like biology-wise, when you see, like the pay it forward movement, when you see something, when you see somebody do something, that's an act of humility, you feel good. 
just the fact of experiencing it. It is contagious to our brains. And I love because I love it when people say that 12 steps is about spiritual, it's not scientific. And I hate to tell them, but it is all scientific. First four steps are about powerlessness and stopping the chemical consumption. You can do that by yourself. Stopping the dopamine-driven behavior. And about step five is when you need somebody else. Eight is when you make amends. It's when you start needing other people because you got to stop the dopamine-driven behavior to get to the serotonin and oxytocin. And God forbid the last and final step is all about oxytocin of keep giving it away and trusting others. It's all science. It's all science-driven. There was a doctor that helped about 10 years ago, a neuroscience guy, and we did when they forced him to comply and he got healthy again, he actually wrote a book of understanding the science behind the 12 steps because he wanted to know because he didn't believe a bit of it until it happened to him. And so he wanted to know. It's a great book. <clears throat> and we know that oxytocin absolutely is an addiction inhibitor. Absolutely. Just over the past couple of years, there's a lot of exciting research. We have not figured out how to operationalize that yet. They're trying nose sprays and all sorts of different stuff because somebody already always asks, well, how do we you know, measure the dopamine and drive and get that in people? We're not going to have an instant fix, but we can understand the, uh, the reality of it. And this is a human being thing. This is how we operate in business. You know, because I do organizational consulting on the side. I have an MBA in healthcare, and I use my psychology, marriage and family therapy, and systems degree in business consulting more than I ever use a business degree. Because businesses are just one family. Do we, do we survive and thrive in a business environment that we don't feel safe, secure, and connected, that we feel like we're a bunch of individuals that we're just surviving ourselves? We don't feel safe there. It's a very fear-based system, right? And maybe even those systems are driven by money and finances, which is a dopamine-driven behavior. You, you do this, you get a bonus, you do this and get a bonus, you do this and get a bonus. That fuels individualism if it's imbalanced. We don't feel safe, secure, and connected, right? We don't follow in like leadership that's driven by profit. We follow and are loyal to people that sacrifice themselves for us that show that humility, that serotonin, right? That's who we follow. It's a human being thing. It's not an addict, an alcoholic. We're not the only ones with a spiritual a monopoly on spiritual bankruptcy. It's a human being thing. We live, in that, we live and work in that type of environment. I've worked in one of those jobs. We don't feel fulfilled. We're unhappy. But if you find a place to work that you feel connected, you feel safe, and whoever's leading the organization extends that circle of safety out from the inner circle to the outer circle. That's when people cooperate. They're not afraid of being of failures because there's teamwork. And they're passionate about why they do it and they're loyal and because we're just safe, secure, and connect. Those are primal needs. That's how we operate better as human beings. That's how we're the best natural versions of ourselves is with a healthy brain. And so these chemicals really throw a imbalanced off of that. And the problem is families experience that same thing. They experience that significant shift when they're trying to keep their child alive. The strongest craving a mammal has is to protect their offspring from pain. And so it drives that behavior. And even today, our industry will shame families, calling them codependent or enabling. And I'm like... God, they're, tra they're trauma survivors. They're resilient just being here, and they need help in education because nobody's helping them and educating them out there. Even in our community of treatment, insurance, which operates at medical necessity, it's easy to find the medical necessity of authorized insurance payment for a broken leg. It's hard to do that for sobriety and anxiety. And so insurance companies barely pay for a minimal of substance abuse treatment for the identified patient. Do you think they ever pay for the family support services if it's driven by medical necessity? So places don't provide it, and so they're operating on their limbic system too because Every human being has two chemicals called adrenaline and cortisol. Those are the stress chemicals. You know, that's what happens when your, your body produces anxiety, and it's supposed to. It's what activates your fight or flight. There's a great book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. 
Because if a lion is coming at you, stress hits you in three screaming minutes, you get out of the way, it saves your life. It's good. But what happens when that gets imbalanced? Chronic stress for any reason is toxic to the brain. Because when it gets imbalanced and you feel, uh, it's when it, acceptance versus being a loner. Like my middle brother was one of, that, one of those that got bullied upon. He was what we call weird comic book guy in middle, middle school, did, said he didn't fit in. The moment he went to Comic-Con in San Diego, he instantly felt like he belonged in his skin because he just connected with everybody there. Self-esteem just went through the roof. Stress went way down. Can you imagine when my mother called every morning at 6.30 a.m., that stress, that cortisol and adrenaline is supposed to hit your system and leave in three minutes? How much she had constantly in her brain? Constantly? Because that is your first line of defense. It's adrenaline and cortisol is supposed to hit your system, make you alert. It's like when things go bump in the night or you've got that gut feeling. It just makes you pay more attention. Is so it prepare to take extra measures to protect yourselves? That's what it's there for, it's a survival part. But what if that's hitting your system every three minutes? It's chronic stress. It's not exclusive to addiction or alcohol. Actually, any family who has somebody with a progressive illness is actually called the stress coping paradigm. Caregiver stress. You can have it when your son dying of cancer, because don't you think at 18 years old, when those Mayo Clinic doctors told them that I wasn't gonna live in two years and had breathing issues, how many nights do you think they slept soundly in my house listening to me breathe, you parents? None. And still to this day, if they hear something, it's like a trauma response, right? It's traumatic, because what happens to your brain or to our brains when that is that hyperactive basal limbic system and shuts down the frontal cortex as well. That's what it does. That's what chronic stress does. Chronic stress teaches your brain to live in a chronically threatening situation. Like, that's why they can judge the temperature of a room like that. Just the smell of a room, if you talk to a family member, a spouse or loved one that has been battling this for years, that's why they have a trauma response. And that's why they lose their self-awareness too because they don't have a, front, a frontal cortex. That's why they keep doing the behaviors. That's why parents drive their kids to the drug dealer and why people take their, I mean, contribute to the enabling behaviors. Is they're just trying to keep them alive. They're driven by dopamine-driven behaviors. That's also why anybody in this industry will tell you the most difficult part of helping anybody, any client, is their family. Their family. <laughs> And it's sad because not one of them is trying to hurt the situation. It's just they're trying, they think they're helping. They're doing something that their brain is teaching them they have to have to survive. This is actually created not too long ago, 50, 60 years ago, because there was a mother with a schizophrenic son and the professionals at that time said, obviously the mother's behavior, because she's nervous and stressed, caused this. And there was a guy that said, no, 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 it's the other way around. It's called the stress coping. This is research and it's accepted. And we know what happens to people's brains. It's called caregiver stress. That's, it's, it's referred to in the medical community. There's usually, in a, when I do this workshop, long days, I have a three minute clip of a Duke oncologist talking about treating cancer. And he talks about it being a partnership between the patient, the family, and him. And oftentimes the family needs more treatment and sources than the, than the patient does. It's a Duke oncologist. It's like a lot of caregivers will feel overwhelmed, exhausted, drained. Sometimes it's physical exhaustion because they're up all night taking care of it or it's emotional exhaustion. That's that chronic stress. What happens with stress is under extreme stress, your frontal lobe turns off and your limbic system activates. And what does that sound like? The patient's brain. It's also why they tell families you experience a parallel process. There's a book written called Parallel Process. We encourage families to read. And this is just stress in general. It shuts off your executive fun functioning, hyperactivates that same part of the brain. And we know that much like substance abuse that can impact the brain, high cumulative stress reduces brain tissue, brain damaging. The flip side of this is functional neurology and treating it the proper way with evidence-based treatment increases gray matter. That way with family members who are very much trauma survivors, just like the patient, they're not codependents, they're trauma survivors. They're resilient for just surviving it. 
why when people do that, you can, you can treat PTSD symptoms and actually elevate people to a higher level of functioning. It's called post-traumatic growth. And actually, gray matter increases. That's also why just historically, suffering brings wisdom. That's why we're attracted to the resilient people who make it through things. That's why, that's why we, we just, we're drawn to people that lean into the discomfort and are resilient. We're not drawn to constant victims and people that blame. We all know somebody in our life that is, likes to blame others and never takes any responsibility and is always the victim. We're not drawn to those, but we're drawn to the people that lean into the discomfort. <clears throat> because treating that properly elevates your level of functioning. You know, it's, stress and anxiety are two different things. Stress is objectively a threat in front of you. Anxiety is perceived. If that line is in front of me, coming at me, that's stressful. But the next day, as I'm remembering that lion, that's anxiety. But your body can't tell the difference. Perceived is just as real. Because if I put two people in a room and shut off the lights and said there's spiders all over the floor, stress and anxiety is gonna come through the roof. You can, you can, that's why that even the perceived thought of what might happen to their loved one if they don't get treatment and why they try to control the narrative and are constantly looking to relieve their loved one's discomfort, sabotaging the professional process um, is a problem. <clears throat> Your brain develops the ability to scan the environment just as how, uh, we're tr how we survive. Fight or flight responses mobil mobilizes to meet those immediate needs. And that chronic stress teaches brains that they exist in a toxic environment despite there not being a war going around, just always on alert. And how do you think that family system operates? That the parents are at each other's throat a lot, it's called parental splitting and just fighting each other and reacting to each other. You think there's much responding rather than reacting? And this is something that just came out in April this is the brain uh, scan of actually of a family member. And this is a family member who went through our, the treatment modality that we put down. And this is one that didn't. One has active frontal cortex and one doesn't. That's why family members, emotionality and emotional intensity does not, should not be allowed to drive objective treatment plans. That's why when a family tries to tell us what they think is necessary or want, it's not that we don't validate it and meet it with compassion, but we're not customer service. Is that what you want from your doctor is customer service? So we got in this predicament. His, his doctor's pay was correlated to patient satisfaction. There's nothing about this that's satisfying. Going to an ER, I tell people all the time, despite our beautiful treatment centers, I've got nice southern rocking chairs and a nice homey environment. I've even got a beautiful therapy lab that comes out and greets you. I could have a therapy unicorn and nobody would want to be there. Nobody will be satisfied being there. Customer service is certain we pay attention to. You always kind, but it's not, it doesn't drive the objective plans. The ability to have crucial conversations from emotionally connected places is key, and that's we've lost that as human beings. That's why we send texts, because we can't have those crucial conversations from emotionally connected places. And this is that lack of connection for because people say, well, he doesn't do very good in social situations and he needs more individual. No, he doesn't. Because right now his frontal cortex isn't working. That processes language and rational thought. It's not working. And right now he just needs stabilization and just connection. I get that that makes him anxious, but nothing about this is going to be comfortable. I don't know many healthcare treatments that are comfortable. But we live in a society that has an absolute inability to be uncomfortable because we'll find immediate relief from it somehow. <clears throat> and living in that environment is tough. That's why an early recovery process, why we separate couples and separate it, it's because that stress those two people's brains that are both operating on alert. How many healthy decisions are made in that? That's why there's a drama triangle. You guys see it all the time. And then you'll talk to somebody, it's like, it's like I didn't even have the conversation with them. It's like, because the rational part of the brain is not working. The insane part of that is we keep doing it. It's like the definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. So I have people, when they first meet the loved one, they're like, you haven't met him and you don't know who he is. I said, I, you just spent an hour telling me he's not your loved one. I don't need to know what his favorite color is. 
right now. His frontal cortex isn't, wor frontal cortex isn't working. Because in the home environment, walking on eggshells, the masks we wear, that families feel like they have to wear because of the stigma, it's stressful. Families experience often more pain than patients do. I didn't learn that until years into this process when I understood how much pain my parents were in. I actually call this the casserole syndrome. Um, when, when somebody, uh, spouses that struggle with spouses that, that have this disease have their own pain and their own uh, suffering, parents do too. It's not, it's not, one's not worse, it's just different. And what I mean by that is, a, some, like I said, the casserole syndrome. When I was 18 and got sick in the, the Outer Banks, every neighbor in the world came over to give, give us casseroles as we were going to all these hospitals. I can smell it to this day. It stings my nostrils. I have, have a trauma response to baked tetrazzini because there was so much of it. It stings my nostrils still, still to this day when I think about it. But that's just the way that the community was coming. Five years later, when I was dying of addiction, how many casseroles were in their refrigerator? None. In fact, they did the opposite, because that disease was going to kill me far worse than the autoimmune disease was. Is there was no connection. In fact, they told people not to be around us, which just drives disconnection. <clears throat> That's why empathy, which is serotonin and oxytocin, is what they need, not punishment. You know, shame is what drives disconnection. You douse it with a little bit of empathy, and that's what, hap that's what connection thrives. <clears throat> the two most powerful words you can say to somebody when they're struggling is, me too. I hear you. Not try to silver lining it. Because that stigma is a powerful motivator for families and patients. Case in point, 30 minutes before pulling in here, I was talking to a dad of a 44-year-old who a month ago, an alcoholic, got drunk, passed out, hit his head in his own apartment because he was living by himself, had a traumatic brain injury, had a TBI and was in Novant Hospital for nearly three and a half weeks. Traumatic brain injury, still drank, still drinking when he got out. And the dad came down from New York this weekend to try to get him into treatment. And I told him all this, I said, yes, and don't let him drive it. He can't drive the treatment plan. He's not going to want to do it. Not only is his brain not working from alcohol, but he just had a traumatic brain injury. It's definitely not working. He's not going to want to do it. And you would never allow his brain to affect his treatment. So, and the dad said, I got it. I got it. I understand it. Last night he talked to him and the kid said, okay, I'll go to treatment. And then called the dad back and said, I just don't, the stigma of being treated like an addict, I just don't want to do it. And the dad called and said, cancel the appointment, we're not coming. And that's what we hear most of the time. It's like, how would you ever let that, in any other healthcare situation, let that drive somebody's medical treatment plan? But that's what we do, well, that's, and that's what the healthcare system does. That's what the doctors do. Tell a family to Google WebMD and find a treatment center that you know, there's no governing our, our industry. There's no governance and regulation. I own a, a treatment facility that the facility is licensed by the Department of Health and Human Services, and you have to have no experience to get that license. It's not like a doctor's office that you have to pass it through the medical board. Anybody in this room could hang a shingle tomorrow and call yourself an interventionist and hang a shingle and open up a treatment center and get a license. Industry outgrew compliance and regulation when the Affordable Care Act hit and just, we just didn't adjust. And so anybody can put up a website and say they do all these wonderful things and you know, parents and family members will read them and say, oh, they do butterfly therapy out there and she likes butterflies, so we're going there. But that's what the healthcare system lays it at their feet. You decide to do it. So what other disease would we do that? And you'd go to an oncologist, they lay out a treatment plan, say, God, it's gonna do it, it's gonna suck, but I'll take off work and, and I'll do it. We don't do it here. Don't do it here. I mean, I had a 23-year-old cousin that was my age. We were best friends. He was a raging alcoholic. Parents didn't want to take him out of Wake Forest. We wanted him to have that degree because they were legacy of Wake Forest. In the semester, December before he graduated, he got a single dr driving accident after drinking 14 beers and died. And they didn't want to take him out of treatment because they wanted that diploma. And that's what we run into. I think they'd want my cousin back and not that diploma that they never got anyway. And that's why family members and patients, when they drive the treatment plan, doesn't go well. 
<laughs> and it's not because they're trying to sabotage the process, it's because their healthcare system has failed them and, and the family and the patient are, work, are operating with brains that are on hijacked. Because family members, uh, uh, they're impacted the same way, emotionally, socially, physically, spiritually. You know, they have, they because, you know, they isolate too. They stop going out, stop doing things, and they don't want to run into their friends on the street and somebody say, well, how's so-and-so doing? Because they don't want to answer it because they don't want to hear how good they're doing and have to say how bad I am and I got to put up a mask or I'm just not going to go and not enjoy it. You know, they have those natural cravings, that constant stress. They're shamed and they can't find answers in the healthcare system. They're often shamed by a legal system or a judge that screams at them. You don't know how I know you're an alcoholic is because you don't think you are one. And, we want the, and they call us in their survival mode and want us to just fix it. Fix it. And that's stressful. <clears throat> and they have a hard time understanding that they, their brain's not working. This is actually a research article that just came out that there was, people are finally studying family members' brains. We've only been shouting it for a decade, but there's, there's no money from insurance companies so with family services yet. But what this says is family member's brain craves the family member just like the identified patient's brain craves the substance. And that's why family members, they get in that pattern of solving the next immediate crisis and they lose awareness. That's why in my intervention practice, they'll call me and say, Ward, I need you to come right now. So how long has this been going on? 15 years. It's like, I know you're in a panic. There is a sense of urgency. And how about let's put down a plan to have, that has some intentional chance of actually working focused on long-term goals and long-term wellness, not solving the immediate crisis or relieving the immediate discomfort. I mean, that's what they're driven by. <clears throat> because, it is, and I can see this with my intervention practice, because I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the show Intervention. Um, gave a bad name to what I do. Um, out in Southern California, I was asked to be a part of that. And they only focus on the immediate crisis. And it's just, it, it, it's, I think it's unhealthy. And because um, people, when they engage with us, it has to a minimum of 90 days. It's just, I don't solve the immediate crisis, getting the loved one in the treatment and then saying, family, take it from there. It's like when you get their patient in the treatment, that's when family needs you the most because they'll sabotage the process because they're not getting the help they need. And so um, I require families to sign up for 90 days. And in the beginning of that, when I solved the immediate crisis and their panic cycle of getting their loved one into treatment, um, I'm the hero and I'm the conquering the day. But a month later, when they're still obsessed with their loved one and need to know, need to know, need to know, and there's a process that has them what I call put down the microscope and pick up the mirror. They don't want to do their own work. Where if I, where they, and before they'll say, I'll do anything for my loved one. And when I get them in the treatment, I'd say, well, you have to come to a two and a half day family program. They say, well, I can't do that. I can't put the focus back on me. Because long term treatment and prognosis for your patients has to do with the family health. It is the ultimate differentiator. If you have a dying plant in unhealthy soil and you pick out that plant and you heal it for 90 days and then put it right back in that soil, what's gonna happen? It's gonna get unhealthy again. And so there, that's why the parallel process happens and now we have the science to show them. It's like, see? And it's not shaming. It's like you're not codependent or you're not, you're a trauma survivor. You're saying this is a trauma response and you need treatment just like they do. And it's hard to get that. It's hard to get that. Most treatment centers don't provide it because insurance companies don't pay for it. That's why in this community, we're just not willing to accept and we're just not gonna provide it. That's why we provide it for free and it's open to the community every week. Thursday night, there's a professionally led group from seven to eight that's led by my team of professionals open to the community and families free of charge. On Sunday nights, there's a educational group for families that's led by me and free of charge. We have a two and a half day family workshop open to the community free of charge. It's the only way to get long-term results. You gotta have that. Because I tell my staff, you can't treat the disease and the family disease, we can't work against that. It's already overwhelming, the opiate epidemic. We, even if we operate it 24 seven, 
We can't, we can't help as many as we that need it. <clears throat> it's called anhedonia that families experience. Pleasure deafness is what that means. You know, your body has a natural pleasure threshold that means you get happy. It's like a standard brand. You go to Disneyland, get happy. Job promotion, happy. Kids do well in school, get happy. Ward lecturing at Charlotte Mech, you get happy. I mean, that's just those are the experiences that make us happy. But with chronic stress, what it resets that imbalance in your brain, and you don't enjoy life that much. It's called anhedonia, pleasure deafness. Families come in our office for the first time, and they look like walking corpses. You can't tell who the patient is and who the family member. I mean, who's who? Because that's what chronic stress does to somebody's health. Cortisol and adrenaline in your system all the time. Significant health problems. In fact, these are a list of symptoms. Nobody knows anybody like that, do they? Um, these are symptoms, loneliness, control issues, cravings, boundary issues, chasing the high, compulsion, obsession, denial, distorted view of reality, present in the identified patient, present in the family member. Yes, yes, yes. These are symptoms. They're not character choices. It's not an indictment on the family either. You know, these are just symptoms that need coaching, education, information, and support. So I say that in our workshop, which uh, families come to where they experience small groups and lectures, it, I say that rows, rows and form and circles heal, and you need both of them. You need a small group to process and get that oxytocin, and, and you need information and educational therapy to combat all the misinformation that's out there. Like you really have to want it. <clears throat> And it's difficult to do that self-care work when somebody says, put down the microscope on others or pick up the mirror, because everybody just comes in there wanting to point or tell us what others need to do. And it's that blame. You know, blame is just a way to discharge your own pain and discomfort, and so families are in pain, so they've got to find something to blame. And so they often want to come and have us focus on the external, and they're trauma-bonded onto the patient. And so a lot of times, especially with the legal system, the leverage that you guys have that's not in the family, we can at least keep them in the treatment or keep them in the spectrum of care compliantly um, and oftentimes away from the family. <clears throat> you know, family members, that, and as, as human beings actually, you know, we get comfortable in the chaos. You know, what is known to us is, even if it's unhealthy, as just a human being, is far more comfortable than the unknown. And this sort of gets to sort of the root problem of the, you know, that we talked about at the beginning is, you know, those dopamine-driven behaviors that impact our entire adult society, their fight or flight, what are they driven by? What are they driven by? It's how human beings, you know, in my experience of 15 years of human behavior and in the now modern research, it's human beings' most dangerous and prominent fear that drives dopamine-driven behaviors, that drives you texting a difficult conversation rather than talking to somebody, that drives staying at work rather than coming at home. It drives blaming Instead of saying, instead of saying, you know, you, when uh, when you came home late and you asshole and you said it, said he's blaming somebody, instead of when you came home, I was scared. When I didn't see you, I felt neglected. When you did this, I was sad. It prevents us from saying that. It's the same thing that is at the root of when a bear and a lion is coming at us is we're vulnerable to their attack. And vulnerability is a human being's ultimate fear and what drives fight or flight. Whether you want to accept it or not, I can't help you with that, but it's still the fact of your biology. Vulnerability is what drives the, the most powerful survival mechanism. So when you're vulnerable, that's what prevents us from allowing us to be seen, it's what prevents us from connecting with our spouses, it's what prevents us from having those crucial conversations from emotionally connected places with people we care about because we're afraid of, I mean, 
afraid that we're not gonna be able to do it, afraid how they're gonna react to us. So it drives it. That's why we send those texts and emails rather than talking to them face to face, because it puts us in too much of a vulnerable situation. That's exactly why. We get down to the root of it. And we're attracted to those people that lean into it. Are we not? That face it? Because vulnerability is actually taking a chance, the definition of it is taking a chance when the results are unknown. Because we're vulnerable, we don't know what's gonna happen. Because I can't tell you how many people have said, I'm so much more comfortable in the family chaos because I know what's gonna happen than what you're telling me. Because somebody's gonna say, well, how many days they're gonna be in treatment, how long? I don't know. I mean, how do you, you want me to give you a finite answer how to treat a progressive and chronic illness? I can't tell you that it's just gonna be 90 days. I can't tell you it's just gonna cost this. I can give you a general idea, but what if on day 89, the symptom rises and he, uh, relapse happens? I'm not gonna say he's ready at 90. I mean, it's a, I tell families you have to trust in the plan and be fluid in the process. And we lose them in the process because we don't like that unknown as just human being. The need to know, the need to know and the need to think it rationally gives us security. The only problem is, you know, what healthcare condition, a really chronic illness, can you treat in a finite linear basis? Where you can say, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this treatment is guaranteed to work and it'll be done then. If this happens, then that happens. And we can't say that. You can't say that with treating cancer, you can't say that with treating substance abuse. You can give general ideas, you can give data, and we can present to them the evidence-based way to give you a 90% chance. But I can't guarantee in just that little bit of unknown scares people. And that's what, we, we see all that in human beings. That's why the gray divorce, divorce over 50 years old, is skyrocketing. It's because in any coupleship, there's a husband and wife relationship and a mom and dad relationship. Two different relationships that need to be equally cultivated. And when couples have children, they get hyper-focused on mom and dad, and they neglect the husband and wife. And then when the last child leaves the house, they're staring across from a stranger. And they're uncomfortable. And instead of leaning in and being vulnerable, they divorce. Right? Happens, it's called the gray divorce. It's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal not too long ago earlier this year. And so can't you imagine that if they have a child at 18 years old that goes through this deadly illness and the chronic stress and... And then when they get through that, then they have a child who gets addiction, the same one, and that battles it. And I was the last child of three boys to leave the house. Then I actually got diagnosed at 18 the day before I was supposed to go to college. And so it gave my family, my parents, something else to hyper-focus on. Because I was supposed to be out of the house, empty nest, the next day, where they would have to face each other again as husband and wife. And that didn't happen because Life took a different turn, and so for the next 10 years, they had something else to focus on. And so when I finally got healthy and stable and living out in California, instead of doing their own work, what do you think happened after 42 years of marriage? They divorced. 42 years of marriage, when they finally had to look at each other, and the idea that they have to get vulnerable and get to know each other again and allow yourself to be seen. It's called emotional honesty. We as human beings fear that. It drives disconnection. It drives dopamine-driven behaviors because this is uncomfortable and I want it to be instantly fixed right now. So I'm gonna stay at work and I'm gonna be on the, the phone and I'm gonna text and I'm gonna be on the iPad and, and even when my child needs something, I'm gonna be at work or be on the iPad or send them a text and I'm not gonna connect with them. And so this is not just an addict or alcoholic problem, this is just a human being issue. <clears throat> and that's why we work with an entire family system. You know, that's why I tell them that you know, the state of their heart is how this is gonna go. You can't change anybody, whether you're a boss at work, in a family. We're all surrounded by autonomous people that don't behave as we think they should, right? How much control do you have over them? And when you say you need to do that, how well does that go over? About as well as when somebody tells you that. About as well as when you're talking to your partner and you tell them what they need to do. How well does that go over? 
How well does that create change? And so this is not about fixing other people. It's about actually creating the change agent. Like they can be the change agent. They have the self-care. They have to put down the microscope and pick up the mirror and that's the best chance they have for their child. Because without a legal system that has leverage or without a diversion program, I'm gonna to have to depend on them being able to have that difficult conversation to say no to force compliance. And when they say, mom and dad, the people at Blanchard Institute are mean to me, which happens all the time, that they don't try to swoop in and come rescue them, that they gotta be able to say no and keep that compliance going. And that, that, that comes from internal strength. Now, whether that's in a family system or at work, it comes from internal strength. Because everybody's affected, whether they realize it or not, everyone whose life touches the identified patient in one way is affected by the disease. And so without help, they choose the only way that they know in their body, they stay and adapt and adopt to the illness. They draw the line, draw the line, draw the line, draw the line, don't realize how far they've gone how crazy things have gotten. It's like I, I'll get a call from a spouse or family member that their loved one held a knife and committed uh, to their throat and then they'll come in two days later when it's just quiet. He said, well, it wasn't really, he, didn't, he didn't hold the knife to my throat, he just kind of held it to my stomach. I'm like, did you hear yourself? But that's a common, it wasn't that bad. It's like he overdosed and flatline two days ago and the conversation to make them upset that you need to go into treatment or I can't support this is too difficult for you that you justify it by saying he didn't hold the knife to your throat, it was just your stomach. It's tough. <clears throat> the problem with that, because there's no healthy way to adapt or adopt that, and there's no healthy way to continue it, like addiction and mental health has to have help to exist. Frontal cortexes don't work. If you operate in the stream of life without a frontal cortex, consequences happen. And so when somebody's living in life with that stream, it has to have help with somebody that stands in the way of the consequences, that calls the boss, that makes the excuses, that bails them out of their six DUI, that um, cleans up after them and pays the rent. It skews their reality. Because that's how we grow and we learn in this world, right? right? Experiencing authentic reality. If you're lying in the bed from chemo and tired, your family coming over there to help clean, put groceries in there, that's a healthy thing to do. You don't, you're not, your reality's not skewed. You don't think you're doing better than you are. But if you're home in your bed, drunk or stoned, and your family comes over, cleans up after you, calls your boss, makes the excuse, and you wake up and say, what do you mean my life is out of control? I'm doing great. No, it skews your reality. And so when families gotta learn, the number one also uh, difference between their idea of help and my idea of help is misunderstanding that word. And nobody's punishing them. Nobody's inflicting pain. Nobody's doing anything to them. Just stepping out of the way of the consequences. You know, if you come in the house drunk and stoned and cuss out and beat your family or physically assault your family and then they say, and you're no longer welcome in this house, nobody's doing anything to you. Those are just standard human being consequences. But families have a difficult time with that conversation because they lose their objectivity. <clears throat> and they just stay and adapt and adapt and they just get to be, that's normal. It just becomes normal. Holding a knife to your throat just becomes normal because they live in that hyperactivated threat. <clears throat> And that's why we, you know, as a way of concluding, all, uh, all therapy and evidence-based modality really well, it turns the focus back on the identified patient, where they stop externalizing the problem, work on the underlying current, and even with the families that go through the parallel process, where they're gonna be hyperactivated and addicted to all information with their loved one, they'll call me, what are they doing in therapy? Are they going to therapy? Are they going to meetings? And our response is, I don't know, are you? They don't like that question. You know, but it, it is a systemic disease and we know all, all evidence base is helping the family because they're the ones that gotta hold that boundary just like Joe Jordan and the legal people do for the licensure professionals, holding the boundary, have to have it, have to. And people with brains that are coming off a of trauma, no, no human being should expect another human being to be able to do that. And so that's why we have such a robust family involvement and require it. 
is because this is how it's supposed to look without the identified patient in the middle. So you're not focused on the disease, but addressing the general family disease. So at all respected treatment, regardless if it's they're considered the top residential place of the country or outpatient or wherever, any place worth its salt of evidence-based treatment has robust family involvement. Because it takes leaning into that discomfort. Just like we said, this is a healthcare issue. It's a healthcare issue. And if it's left up to families at no fault of their own, because they try help and they come to doctors and they come to therapists and they, just the healthcare system is not set up to help. Insurance companies make this incredibly and unfairly expensive. They receive an enormous amount of judgment. Even our own healthcare system does that. One of the greatest partnerships we've created in a couple years was with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. It was somebody that, an organization for 15 years, was like dancing with the devil. But we created, we started providing these services for free and then tracked the outcomes and then I was able to go to the Blue Cross and Blue Shield CEO and say, X, Y, and Z is happening. Look at our outcomes. How about help us out with a little bit of a contract? Because you can't say what you're doing is working because North Carolina is one of the worst in the country and you're 80% of the pair mix. And the guy there was named Dr. Patrick Conway. He was a pediatrician, just took over Blue Cross and Blue Shield CEO 2017. And he said, email me. And I just thought he was giving me lip service. But I emailed him and he emailed me right back. And within two months, we had a partner. And then in June, you never know what people are going through. Dr. Patrick Conway was pulled over, given a DUI. He went to treatment for a month, came out with it, and they fired him. And what an embarrassing message to send to our community. Reach out and get help. With 76% of people who struggle with this in the workplace, 80% of the payer mix of these families didn't use you to get help, and you fire the leader. Seems like a missed opportunity to me. And you wonder why people don't reach out and get help and are afraid, because they're vulnerable. And so evidence-based treatment, this is some things that we offer. These are the free family services. This is February 21st, 22nd. The day and a half is free. You can come and sign up. It's Friday night, Saturday. Well, it's free. This is some Thursday night. It's free, professionally led. The resources are out there because educational therapy, knowledge is power for these families. Because all too often their loved one doesn't want to get treatment and they don't understand it and think they know it or will Google WebMD or read off a treatment center site that is not governed or unlicensed and, and will therapists shop because their survival mechanism won't allow them to sit and feel the discomfort. But they need they need these things to survive, the oxytocin, serotonin, they need somebody to say, and you don't have to do this alone. <clears throat> so it's out there, because evidence-based treatment really has to do with a collaborative approach. Just like with that complicated medical illness, I had endocrinologists and rheumatologists and oncologists. It's, it, takes a, it takes work with the legal system, the CMPD, if we're gonna solve this opiate problem, it takes partnerships between community, that's why, I partner with Atrium and the Dilworth Center and we all work together because 10% of people who only get treatment out of the millions that need it, 90% doesn't. It's not competition. If you want to fight over that 10%, have at it. But if you want to work together as a community to get the other 90, that's how we're going to solve it. And we've got to have cooperation with the legal system. Got to have cooperation with CMPD. And I get that it's overwhelming and I get that it's unfair and that's our reality. And so helping to inform and provide resources to add that empathy and opportunity, uh, understand it's a brain, it's a disorder, it's not a choice. And families, it's, you're not a character flaw, and parents, it's not about what you didn't do or could do. I was on a podcast the other day, and the, a podcast the other day, and the person doing the podcast said, how can I be a good dad and ensure my child doesn't get this? It's the first thing you realize, you can be a great dad, and this still happens. And so as a community, just, Empathy and perspective shift are the two things that really need to happen. And I hope this information and education provided that. And it was like drinking out of a fire hose for two hours, but I'm four minutes late. I usually ended right on time, and before Michelle comes in here with a blow dart and gets me, um, I want to go ahead and end. This is our, our resources. We had numbers out there. We just want to be a resource. There, are, We work with uh, legal offices all over Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, plenty of times where people call us with cases that have already 
looking at it, you know, kids will go through this drug charge and have a month in jail or this, that, and they'll call me and we'll create a plan to go into treatment and then this aftercare and we'll get this letter to the probation office and the judge, how about not put them in jail and do this? I mean, we work with all sorts of uh, stuff like that all the time. And, um, and even if you just need a resource where you contact the XYZ's going on, where do they go? Because that is the thing. This industry has outgrown compliance and regulation and just getting them into rehab, unfortunately, through nobody's fault and shame on us, there's not that many places that provide ethical evidence-based treatment that's worth the family sacrificing money and every place should be vetted for you. So be happy to do that you know, free and it should be a community resource and partner. So that is my cell phone. This disease doesn't operate on a Monday through Friday, nine to five schedule. So it's out there. Um, and just want to thank you for sitting here and taking the fire hose for two hours and, and uh, hope it was enlightening. So thank you. <laughs>